loudly and clearly. We know I'll be loud. We don't know if I'll be clear. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Ripley Presbyterian Church and the celebration of the Lord's Day in worship. It's such a joy to be back with you today. I was away last Sunday and uh, missed worshiping with you, and I pray that you had a moving, worshipful experience, and we are grateful to be together again and grateful to have those of you who are joining us virtually today as well. We will be celebrating Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper today. I invite you, if you are participating virtually, to uh, procure your elements for the meal this morning, if you'd like to share, or if you watch this worship at a later time. You can certainly gather your bread and juice or wine or uh, what other symbolic elements you'll have that most closely resemble those crossed by crackers. And, uh, but what we will share today, I'm going to go over this in our worship setting. We have the prepackaged elements, and what you'll do is pull the top layer off of your little deal. If you want to go ahead and do that, you certainly can. Uh, there's two different preparations, so if you need help with that, uh, maybe your neighbor can assist as well. See, so I made a mistake of mine. I pulled the uh, both and off, so I already have my juice available, but that's okay. Maybe you can do it that way. Pull the whole thing off if that's what happens. Then you'll have access to your juice, and then the other preparation you can pull off for your weight. <laughs> Did I explain that correct? I, you, you can tell I don't normally do this. I get to eat the fresh bread, and y'all have to eat this old nasty stuff. So let's not do this anymore. <laughs> it's about time, isn't it? Um, so I'm not doing a good job explaining that. Yes, it's the little purple or lavender, whatever color you might say. Pull off the purple portion to get access to your bread. Some would say that's an insult to bread to call that bread, but I would say that it's not just stale, it's unleavened. Wouldn't y'all? Those are wafers. So if you'd like to go ahead and prepare your elements, please do so. Are we uh, broadcasting, Jennifer? Everything's good there. Can't say enough to uh, express my gratitude for Jennifer and Lynn for their leadership in our worship and certainly everything you did last Sunday for our guest preacher to help make things run smoothly. Okay, let's share in our announcements, and then we will uh, begin uh, our worship time shortly. There is an announcement. Okay, so we are celebrating, as I said, Holy Communion, and uh, there's an announcement. This is Pastor Appreciation Month. Thank you. Someone snuck a beautiful caramel cake into the pastor's study. Uh, don't ask my family if it was good because they may not know anything about it. That may just hang out in my car for the next two or three days. Oh, y'all have already heard me, haven't you? So I have to share. Grateful for that. Jennifer, thank you. Shirley, did you teach her how to make those caramel cakes or did she do that all herself? It's chocolate. Oh, it's chocolate. Good. Great. My favorite. Very good. Okay, other announcements that we have today. Are there any that we need to share verbally this morning? Our nominees, we continue to take nominees for the elder class, correct? Uh, so if you'd like to nominate those to serve in the class of 2024, that'll be a three-year term, please uh, fill out your nominee your nominees on the uh, registration form that's inside of your bulletin, or the nomination form, rather. We'll also be nominating one elder to fill the unexpired term for the class of 2022. So two elders for the class of 2024, one elder for 2022. So we look forward to uh, you submitting those today, uh, or rather tomorrow is the last day to receive those. Your church session will be meeting soon, as well as the nominating committee to review those. Uh, also, your session will be meeting soon. One of the top agendas we're going to have is to when we're ready to start Sunday school back. I know many of you are ready, 
So we'll begin a plan of discernment and discussion of the exact date on that. So that's what's coming next here at Ripley Presbyterian Church as we begin our, our transition of living, continuing to live with COVID-19, but also transitioning to the church after the pandemic. So we're grateful for that. I know many of us are ready. So Sunday school, more to come soon as your Christian Education Committee and your elders begin that discernment going to be sooner rather than later all right good news um other are there other announcements we want to share verbally before we lift up our prayer concerns and joys lorenzo's, lorenzo's out thank you kathy for updating us on lorenzo and we'll be prayerful for our dear friend uh let's do uh let's we have uh our prayer list that we want to lift up Today, we do have Lorenzo on there, and we'll continue to be prayerful for him and all of our loved ones. We're praying for Randall Beavers especially. He's had some serious health concerns this week. Glad you're here worshiping with us. Glad to have you and uh, everyone that's uh, back with us who hasn't been able to get out in some time. Um, and and I, Louise... Uh, Miller family, we want to be prayerful for. Did I say her name correctly, Louise? Uh, Louise Miller family, uh, she passed away recently. She is the, uh, no, is that right? Did I say it correctly? Grandmother-in-law of Robert. Gotcha. Yes, yes. So we want to be prayerful for the Miller family. Also, a friend of mine, Dr. Clinton Buck, died uh, very early yesterday morning, former professor at uh, Memphis Theological Seminary, and he was the interim president and dean at one time. So be prayerful for Clinton's family. We lift them up. Are there other additions to our prayer list? Oh, okay. Goodness. Okay. So we'll be prayerful for, for Helen and uh, Robert and Got mom and brother both on there. We'll be praying for him. Are there others? I'm speaking to Linda up there. Y'all <laughs> see me waving. Okay, dear friends. Well, this is the day our Lord is made. Let us worship him now in joy and in gladness. <laughs> Beautiful words and message in song there. His eye is on the sparrow, and 
I know God is watching me. Let's respond to that beautiful prelude by sharing in our scriptural call to worship. The psalmist shares these words. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. Let us respond to that call by sharing together in a prayer of confession and receiving together God's forgiveness. Would you pray with me? Almighty and merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts, and we have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is nothing good in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare those, O oh God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent. According to your promises declared unto men in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grant that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of his name. Amen. Would you receive with me these words of life? For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. This proves God's love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. Friends, Church, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. This morning's first reading comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. If you'd like to follow along, you can look in your pew Bible on page 220. Indeed, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before Him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Be Let's pray together again. Oh God, we come into this sacred setting to worship you, to 
proclaim your goodness, to embrace your grace, to say thank you, O oh God, for your love, for the life we have in you. And even as we confess our sins and receive your promise of forgiveness, we also yearn, O oh God, for a more abundant life that you promise in us, not only life without end, but life in all of its fullness. And we don't know the answers in ourselves. We surrender in every way we can in, in uh, our own even heart's desires and opinions this day. We seek you. We ask God as we seek your word and read your scripture that you give us the ears to hear, the hearts to receive, and the willingness to go forth with our hands and feet in your ways to serve this world through your love and for your glory. So will you come, O Holy Spirit, as we pray for your illumination, for you to light our path. Will you give us the eyes to see what directions you would have us to go as individuals, as a church, as a community, as believers seeking to live out your light in a world of darkness. May we be molded, O oh God, through this reading and made more in your image. For you are our rock and our redeemer. In Christ we pray. Amen. Our second lesson of the scripture for our sermon today is from the Gospel of Mark. We'll begin in, uh, excuse me, with verse 17 in chapter 10. Listen with me. For the word of the Lord. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witnesses, you shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked, and he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who were first will be last, and the last will be first. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. When I traditionally reflect upon this uh, familiar passage to many of us in our worship setting, and I've been here long enough now that y'all probably heard this Scripture about three times because as I follow the lectionary of 
preaching through the Bible basically in three years, this text comes up for us about every third year. Manya told me yesterday, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that scripture. But sometimes if we strive, we can hear the text with fresh ears. Now I do want to touch on just a bit of the traditional interpretation of this text where we wrestle with the fact that we all have wealth. I'm troubled by what Mark said. He said how hard it is for those who have wealth, even before he got into talking about the richness of this ruler or this young man. But Jesus is quoted by Mark that said how hard it is for those who have wealth. Concerning our views before our God, we all have wealth, so it's hard for us all, right? In fact, if you compare our living standards to those of the first century world, those who Jesus was ministering to, there was not a middle class. There was the haves and there was the have-nots. So anyone who had substance, who was relying upon their own security and strength, they were as easy for a camel to go through an eye of an eagle, Jesus said, for them than for them to have life. And I'm hearing here these words of the young man where he says at the very beginning of our passage, he asks this question. In this translation that we receive today, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You see, uh, like many of us at times, this person has known success and he's grown in his uh, understanding that he needs to be accountable for his actions. Certainly not a uh, embarrassing calling for us to take responsibility for our life, our family, our faith, and certainly our relationship with God. So he wants to know, what must I do? But it's important for us to understand the depth of what our Lord is saying where he says, for man, for humanity, for us broken people, it's impossible. But with not with God, for with God, all things are possible. If we back up to verse 15 in this passage, it was then that Jesus said, as the children were coming to him, he said, let the little children come to me. For unless you, speaking to all of us who search to have life in God, unless you receive the kingdom of God like a little child, you'll never enter. You see where Jesus is turning our faith upside down in this passage today. And as he's teaching with this young person seeking to grow in his faith, he says, it's not what you do that defines life in Christ is what you receive. In other words, it's what's done for you. You know, many of us this time of year begin watching our favorite football teams on Saturday. And uh, up until yesterday, or last night, Nick Saban had never lost a football game to one of his Underlings are people who'd grown up under his tutelage. And that ended last night, right? And some of my Mississippi State fans say since that, since Texas A&M beat Alabama and Mississippi State beat Texas A&M, Mississippi State should be number one team in the country. <laughs> Nick Saban's still a pretty good football coach, right? And I heard him say recently in an interview, he said the quarterback is the most important person on our team because he touches the ball the most. That makes sense. You want someone you can count on. And I saw a game last night where they were uh, the announcers were bragging that in the Alabama game, and they were bragging on this wonderful catch that a receiver made, and the commentator, one of them was a former quarterback, he said, now that was a good catch, but... I really got to brag on the pass. He said, without the quarterback, the guy would have never gotten the ball. You see, that's the way it works in football. No matter how good of a receiver you are, 
If it's not thrown to you, you're never going to score. You're never going to know the joy, the excitement, the elation of receiving and sharing in victory. You're dependent upon someone to give it to you, right? If that's true in sport, how much more true is it in faith and life in God? We, dear friends, are the receivers. There's nothing we can do to know joy, fullness, victory in life unless someone gives us the ball and takes us across the line to victory. We are in need of something far greater than a quarterback. We're in need of a Savior. And all we do is receive what he gives to us. It's not what we do as Mark quotes Jesus in our text today, but it's what we receive, Deborah, to give us joy in life eternal and more abundant life now. That's the gift of grace that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gift of his love. As Jennifer read in that Hebrews text today where he came down from heaven and became the high priest for us as God's children. Wow. Can you consider with me today the magnitude of God's love for us to claim us as children of the King of glory? That is love that transformed the world. And all we do is understand it's not what we do. It's what's been done. But you know... I felt a pushing in our gospel today to consider this text, as I shared earlier, Lamont, with fresh ears. In a way, I'd not in some time that really there's a great message in this text more than simply about life eternal, as though that weren't enough. But how do we receive the abundant life in Christ? Jesus quotes here, an exchange where, and I've, I've written it down here in, in the last few verses of our text, the exchange he has with Peter, where Peter says, look, we've left everything just to follow you. And Jesus said, I tell you, there's no one who's left all these things that you have who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. And he goes on to say, and in the age to come, eternal life. But let's not miss what Jesus is saying to Peter now. In following me, in surrendering to me, you have abundance. That's the words that Jesus says, even now in this life. Let's unpack that a little bit. Really, the essence of this exchange with Jesus and Peter and the message that Jesus, I think, proclaimed to the young man seeking for eternal life was that beyond the beginning of the relationship in life, when we surrender our lives now, we have a life far greater than any joy we could have ever accomplished or attained in this world. There is life in surrender. You know, I looked up that word surrender earlier in the week, and the definition of the word surrender, it, it speaks of, I'm paraphrasing now, of when we're facing an opponent and we no longer offer a resistance, we give up, basically, our movements to their control. So there's a couple different ways to look at that. Maybe we've played mercy with somebody back when we were young people, and you have to surrender to make the pain go away. And, and in that surrender, you're admitting that they are stronger than you, at least in that specific moment. What if we consider the depth of Jesus' call upon us as his brothers and sisters 
that when we surrender, we admit that we need a strength greater than our own. Not only are we admitting in our surrender that God is stronger and God can guide us through every adversity that we face, but there's also a willingness to entrust God with our future. You see, if someone surrenders themselves to their legal standing, they're no longer in control of what comes next. Friends, could it be that Jesus is saying to the young man in our text today and saying to us, the most abundant life is when we surrender control to Almighty God for the direction and the desires of our heart to find the fullness and abundance in this life, as Jesus says, and in the life to come. In other words, understanding, even beyond what Jesus said to the young man in our text today, it's not about what we do. It's about what we receive, or more importantly, who we receive for life eternal and for life more abundant even now. So friends, may we recommit ourselves today as we seek more joy in our professions, more comfort in our daily walk, more balance with the pressures and stresses of life, more fullness in family. May we in every way we can Surrender more fully to God's guidance and strength to give us the life not only without end, but with an abundance of joy and love. Amen. Amen. I ask you to uh, join with me now as we lift up together the prayers of God's people. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this gift of worship and love and life that we have in you. We pray, oh, Lord, for those you've entrusted us to minister to most of all, our friends, our family, our neighbors, our community. We have special concerns today that we've listed verbally. We've written on our bulletin, our prayer list. We also pray for the names that are unspoken, that are written on our hearts. We ask for healing and wholeness and miracles of grace. We ask, O oh God, that you pour forth light and love as we serve this community through you for your glory. We ask that those that are on our prayer list and those that are written on our hearts that you Bring healing, whether the illness be spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, or relational. You, O oh Lord, are our physician. We pray for our nation. We lift up our president, our senate, our congress, the Supreme Court. We pray for those who guard and defend our freedom in our military. Pray for our state, county, city, governing bodies, for all who hold authority and power over others. We pray for the employers, for our economy. As we pray for the powerful and rich, we pray for those who are called to serve most of all, the weak, the least, the last, and the lost. May we, through our ministries of not only what we say but what we do, let them see you, Jesus, in us. We pray, O oh God, for ourselves. Each of us bow now in your presence, lifting up our individual wants. And in every way that's pleasing to you, may you bring healing and wholeness and miracles of grace when our wants can be consistent with your needs for our life, O oh God. And as your children, we have confidence now as lifting our voices as one and saying together the words you taught us, praying our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I invite you now to stand with me. And as we prepare to be nourished with God's table, remember what it is that we believe about our God and our Savior. Would you join with me in affirming our faith? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It's my true pleasure as your pastor to invite you to this holy feast. Many of us receive these elements at times with guilt, wondering if we're worthy or we're able to receive the body and blood of Christ symbolized in the Lord's table. If we don't feel we deserve this meal, then we need it most of all. You see, we don't come to table because of our worthiness, but because God is able. It is in receiving this holy feast that we're reminded that Jesus gave his very body and blood that we may have life, yes, without end, but also in abundance. So I invite you. You don't have to be a member of this congregation. You just have to be a person in need of the nourishment Jesus Christ. May you share in this holy feast. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for these elements, for this bread and this wine that remind us that you gave your very life that we may have life in abundance. May we receive in the breaking of this bread and the receiving of this cup. May we remember that you gave your all that we all may have life in you. May you nourish us and speak to us in ways beyond what we can even understand about your grace and love. In Christ we pray. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the very night of his betrayal and desertion by friends, people of faith, the brokenness of the world, took bread and broke it. And in that meal, he gave this bread to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Will you join with me now in the breaking and receiving of the bread? After the meal, Jesus took the cup and proclaimed that this is the cup of the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood that has been shed for you. Take, drink of this cup, even as you've eaten of this bread, and do this in remembrance of me, and know that in this cup there is life. Will you receive with me the cup of salvation?
Oh Lord, we meditate upon the holiness of this feast that reminds us that you tasted death and sin and brokenness, that your body was broken as this bread that our bodies may be restored, that your blood was poured forth as the fruit of the vine that we may have life and fruitfulness forever. May you nourish us with this holy feast that we remem remember that in holy communion we are one called by you to live out your love to all around us. In the name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. And now dear friends and church, may we go forth renewed in our commitment to surrender ourselves to the love of Christ and give him to all around us in what we do and say. Will you receive with me God's blessing for us as his children? May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance, his gaze upon you. And give you peace now and forever.